This is a time of great opportunity for BHP. The resources we produce are essential to the energy transition and global economic growth. Our products are fundamental to the way we live now and into the future. Now more than ever, we need to provide the world the resources it needs responsibly and sustainably. Imagine what we can achieve if we continue to think big. welcome you to this panel session, wherever in the world you may be joining from. My name is Janine Herzig and I'm President of the OzIMM and Chair of the Board. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet today. In particular, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to Elders past and present. OzIMM is the peak body leading the way for people in the resources sector representing more than 13,000 members around the world. We shape careers, showcase leadership, create communities and uphold standards. We are a proud founding partner of IMARC and thrilled that this event is connecting thousands of people from our global mining and resources community. Today's panel session is on the importance of developing a skilled workforce for the digital age. The resources sector, like much of the world, is seeing technological change and adoption accelerate at an unprecedented rate. This poses important questions for the mining workforce, who are, after all, the life of the sector. Some of the areas we will explore in this session are how mining professionals can be better supported in understanding, implementing and leading digital change how we can facilitate a strong workforce pipeline at all career levels, and the importance of lifelong learning amidst this accelerated period of change. OzIMM is very passionate about supporting a skilled workforce for the future, and does this in a variety of ways. Formal and informal mentoring, providing scholarships and awards, including on the job work experience, our in-person and online professional and technical conferences and courses, to name a few. The importance of having a skilled pipeline of professionals is very important to me personally and professionally. And I'm joined today by two people who are equally passionate about this topic. And they are Jill Terry, Vice President of Technical Capability at BHP, and Darren Stralo, Chief Development Officer at Northern Star Resources. So I'll kick off the batting now uh, with a couple of questions for our panelists. And I'll start by asking uh, Jill, if you'd like to go first, uh, what does the digital age mean for the resources sector? That's, uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Janine. Um, look, technology is changing the way that the resources industry professionals work. And, and indeed changing the skills that will be required by the industry in the future. Autonomous operations require a step change toward improved, um, or provide rather a step change toward improved safety. However, this means that data collection, for example, also needs to be autonomous because it won't be safe to have people in the mines taking samples. Equally, airborne geophysical and hyperspectral sensors enable preliminary exploration without land disturbance. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are being applied for exploration targeting. However, there's still much to learn um, as the industry experiments with digital innovation. Innovative sensors have the potential to collect valuable quantitative data. However, next gen professionals, in addition to applying their fundamental knowledge, they'll also need to decide which sensors are they going to select um, that they're going to deploy um, and in what locations to provide the right data to underpin optimal decision making for resource development, extraction and processing. The potential to unlock value is significant and it's an exciting time to be part of the industry. But as a minerals industry, we can learn a lot also about the application of technology for data collection, processing and decision making from our oil and gas um, counterparts who actually have decades of experience in this area. Given the diversity of BHP's portfolio, 
we believe that we're actually uniquely positioned to to learn from oil and gas and apply this knowledge and get and have the understanding about equipping the workforce for the future. As we transition to the digital age, BHP has developed a framework of um, workforce capability requirements from graduates through to subject matter experts. And, and we're sharing that framework with universities to help them to guide future capability development requirements and also their learning programs as they rebuild curricula to, um, to address the needs of the future. I'll probably leave it there. Thanks, Jill. Yes, I think um, very important to have that cross uh, collaboration uh, with other industries mm -hmm. who uh, may face very similar challenges. So that's really important. And Darren, for you, uh, what does the digital age mean for our sector? Uh, look, it really does mean a lot of change. And I think it's going to be positive change to the sector. Uh, you know, picking up from what Jill said, there's a lot of things that have been introduced in recent years and we can see on the horizon being introduced. Uh, and what this is gonna, gonna mean is that, you know, I guess it all comes down to better decision-making at an operational level. And with better decisions, this means, you know, safer minds, more productive minds, more cost-effective minds. Uh, and that in turn will, be, will mean that minds that might not have been economic in the past can then become economic uh, and is going to create the new war bodies of the future. So it's going to, you know, the way that we approach mining, I guess, um, you know, the mining methodology um, has the opportunity to change through all this as well. Um, and I guess from that people perspective, I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity, right? Like mining used to be an industry for, you know, big burly men that want to be living out in the country and getting dirty every day. Uh, and that's not what modern mining is. Um, you know, this technology revolution is going to change the type of people that are going to be effective on a mine site from a from a day to day basis. And you know, that's from you know professional to technical to operational levels. Um, and it's going to require new skill sets. And uh, I mean, as an underground gold miner, and I've been predominantly an underground miner my whole career. Um, you know, we are still seeing. Uh, and yet to see a lot of the technological changes that the surface miners have had. And a big part of that is communication. So, you know, um, when you're on the surface, you've got GPS, you've got 5G, you've got all these things that you can assist to, to get you there. And um, they allow you to make all these fundamental changes to how you, uh, you operate and your methodology. We're still yet to see that from an underground perspective because we haven't solved the issue of uh, comms and pervasive comms in underground mining. And when that comes, um, which I know a lot of people are working on and a lot of smart minds have been applied to, when that comes in coming years, that's going to change underground mining as well. And, um, and look, I think it's just an exciting time and it's going to just attract a, a new breed of people and a new breed of professional to the industry. Thanks, Darren. You, you touched there on uh, skills and the new skills that will be required. Um, could you just expand a little bit on uh, what some of those future skills the mining professionals will need to have? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, I think it's a, it's a really good point because, um, you know, you look back at recent times and we've seen that, you know, modern Australia still is very reliant on the resources industry and very reliant on mining. We're a huge part of the economy and, if, and um, and a significant part. Um, so look, the answer is that we have to attract the best skills and the best people and we have to stay relevant. And um, you know, I think that there's many ways to, to think about that. And um, you know, I was involved in uh, recently in the redesign of the mining engineering curriculum uh, at the School of Mines, which was a, you know, very, a very good initiative that was taken up by Curtin at the time. Um, and when we were looking at it, we looked, we, we saw it as um, sort of four pillars. So there was the scientific foundations of engineering. And I think that's, you know, across any, um, you know, discipline, whether it's the, you know, scientific foundations of, you know, geology, metallurgy, um, any other professional um, sort of degree you'd look to have in mining. Um, then there's the mining fundamentals. So mining methods, mining systems, how you can apply those scientific foundations to, to mining fundamentals that creates that base of knowledge. Um, then on top of that comes the value additions and that needs to be pervasive through the whole thing as well. But that's where your, you know, your technology, your data analytics, your mine economics uh, all ties into uh, those sort of skill sets and what you need. 
Um, and then what we can't forget through it all in modern society, you need that big focus on license to operate. So how mining contributes to society, how we protect the environment, how we, you know, stay good corporate citizens. I mean, I think that, that when we designed that, it was, um, it was done in a really positive way. Um, and, you know, it's a good start that can be applied over sort of any degree and any discipline. Yeah, it's um, glad you, you brought up the uh, the social performance side of things, Darren. Um, and uh, OzIMM's actually recently um, put out a social responsibility framework for our members uh, at various levels, depending on uh, what uh, competencies they have and whether they're social performance professionals. Um, and I think it's really important that all professionals, you know, have that basic knowledge uh, in that area. And uh, we've also put out a public statement um, around uh, that uh, social value as well. So, um, Jill, did you have anything to add on in terms of the future skills that our professionals will need? I think Darren, Darren's actually covered it um, very well. I think um, we also need to be cognizant when we think about future professionals, about the opportunities um, for the industry to retrain people to, to take up um, professional careers. And so I, I think there's, well, in fact, I know that there is uh, a number of um, micro-credential units that um, are, being, are being and have been created across the mining engine engineering space. Um, I know that uh, there's also opportunity in the metallurgy space and I'd like to see more in the in the earth sciences area um, where we can actually take people whose roles may um, actually become redundant because of the, the technological change to the industry but we can actually provide those people um, if, if they want to with the skills to, um, to take on uh, professional careers. So I think, um, you know, we have, the, we have the, the areas that we need to focus on, but then we also need to be thinking about what is the pipeline for those future professionals. And, um, and so there is potential in the retraining space, but it's also about developing interest uh, for young people in terms of, uh, of the, a future career within the resources industry. Yeah, the, that point about the retraining is a really important one and uh, actually leads in nicely uh, to the next uh, area I'd like to explore. Um, the concept of lifelong learning is a really important one uh, and it's one that OzIMM facilitates through our Chartered Professional Program, which has at its core the requirement to be qualified, competent and current. And by current, I mean via continuous professional development. So how do we, uh, Jill, if you'd like to tackle this one first, how do we as an industry encourage professionals to adopt a continuous learning mindset? Yeah, it's, uh, that, that's an interesting challenge. Um, look, people are natural learners. They're, they're naturally curious and it is about providing the tools for people to um, to to express that interest in learning. And But it's not just about the... Um, the theoretical learning it is also then about the practical application of that theoretical learning and so uh, I think if we look back to a couple of decades ago we had um, some some dedicated institutions like the Australian Mineral Foundation that provided a lot of learning packages um, those those groups actually don't exist these days and so it really is about being resourceful in terms of looking at where are the opportunities for um, providing that lifelong learning. And so um, we do have um, opportunities in terms of the universities and the, the courses that some of the universities are, are offering in both the micro-credential area, as well as um, courses that, that are dedicated to um, essential learning in very specific areas. And so one example would be the, the University of Western Australia um, in collaboration with BHP and Rio Tinto is developing a, a hands-on and theoretical um, piece of learning on tailings management. Um, but you, then you have University of Queensland that's providing um, advanced metallurgical um, learning, et cetera. So um, there, there is quite a lot in that space. 
there is one other initiative um, in the mining engineering space that, um, that ourselves and Anglo-American are um, supporting, which is with the AMPS group to provide advanced learning uh, across the mining engineering and mine planning space for industry professionals. And um, that's going to be um, a, effectively 150 modules is my current understanding. Um, that really looks, goes every, everywhere from foundational. And I think foundational is really important for cross-discipline understanding as well. So um, the foundational unit, which is actually not far uh, from being launched, um, will be for naught to five years in the in the mining in in the young mining professionals um, area for mine planners, etc. But it will also be a great piece of knowledge that um, geoscientists and metallurgists and surveyors can take or home in terms of how do they how do they relate better and actually add more value when they're working with mining engineers? Um, so those units will actually, when they're developed, will be available um, for a fee um, and, uh, and that will become available through AMPS on a, on a common platform. So I think that's a, a great opportunity for um, mining professionals to, to uplift skill. Um, and, and then of course we have the, um, the, the, the usual um, um, offering of conferences, etc., for people to to learn from others, because again, that's really important to um, to take the positives, but also learn from learn from when things don't go so well, so that you can actually help to refine um, what you do as a professional as you go forward. So yeah, we're all we're always learning, and uh, and it's actually having those tools available to to do so. Great, thanks, Jill. Uh, Darren, uh, your thoughts on how we can encourage professionals uh, to adopt continuous learning? Yeah, great. And look, I think Jill made some, some awesome points there. And that online education piece, I think, is something that is going to grow a lot in the next few years. It's, it's, you know, that traditional having to take a couple of weeks off work to go to university and sit down and do a face-to-face -face course. Um, you know, in modern mining, that's not necessarily practical, whereas... You know, a lot of these online offerings that are coming now are just, they have that availability. You know, they're relevant, they're driven by industry, there's smart people getting involved uh, and they are keeping them relevant and that availability of them um, being on these awesome online platforms that have come up now is, uh, is going to drive a lot of, um, I guess, involvement from people and ability for people to, to get access to them. So, look, I really do think that's a, that's a great initiative going forward. Um, look, one thing I'd kind of like to touch on as a part of this is that as corporates, we have a huge part to play in this. And, you know, that's the, you know, the empowerment of our professionals and the empowerment of people to be able to, you know, learn on the job, do projects on the job, um, you know, try things out, fail them, be rewarded for that and, you know, try new things. And this is, this is really where, you know, the fundamental, you know, everyday sort of work that someone can do can drive into it. You know, it comes down to the culture of the, the companies and the culture of the professionals that are starting to come through. Um, I remember reading an article in the Financial Review um, a year or so ago um, that was this big surprise article that said junior staff are showing up CEOs and boards on mining innovation. And I thought that that was funny because they talk about it as a shock. Uh, but, you know, I've run the graduate program here at Northern Star for, for the last sort of nine or so years. And, um, you know, we, we bring in, you know, current years, we're bringing in 30 to 40 graduates a year. And just the, the, the skills and the um, curiosity that these guys bring in uh, from the very start is so impressive and as a company it's, it's our spot it's our position to to try and utilize on some of that enthusiasm and and some of that sort of new skill set to to drive things i mean um you know when i went through university uh i had a you know nokia 5110 mobile phone that had you know the little keypad on it you could maybe play a game of snake if you wanted to um and that was how i stayed connected with the world uh, you know, you look at this new generation and they've got supercomputers in their pockets and they've grown up with technology and they've grown up with innovation and they've grown up with, uh, you know, this sort of um, outlook on life where things can always be improved and things can always be optimised. If you get them into businesses and then start to 
give them projects where they can utilize some of that to improve their work life. Um, and, you know, you, you give them, you know, some budgets some projects, uh, some time to be able to invest in that side of things. You can see those results as a company. So I think that, look, I love the, the online learning, the outside of work learning part of it. I think, the other side of it is, you know, these guys are coming, doing long rosters, spending time at work, having that, um, you know, the corporate support and the company culture of, uh, you know, empowerment to, to drive learning and try new projects and implement technology and, and be owners of that coming forward. We start that with our, with our graduates and then, you know, these guys are, are the guys that are uh, that'll be in the industry and, and leading the industry in future years. And, and that's going to be a huge part going forward too. Absolutely. Uh, showing my age here, Darren, but uh, we didn't have mobile phones at all when I was at university. And I think we, we had about five computers that we shared in the entire metallurgical engineering uh, department. So yes. <laughs> things have changed very rapidly. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned culture, Darren, um, because I think that is really the key uh, you know, to all of this, you know, um, you know, you notice that businesses that encourage that creative thinking and, you know, over compliance so that people do feel safe uh, to express their ideas and, and you know, to uh, experiment with different things. Uh, and if they fail, they fail. But, you know, you, you have that sort of open culture. So I think um, that's really, really important. Uh, Jill, I know that uh, you're involved in a very exciting uh, program uh, that uh, is happening soon, I think. So would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. Um, so it is exciting. It's, I guess when we think about um, the, the future professionals within the industry, we really should be thinking right back to the start of that pipeline, and that's our school kids. And, um, and so this is an area that I'm really passionate about because there are many people who, who currently work in the industry who literally fell into it accidentally. Um, they didn't have prior exposure. And, um, and so um, I think it is really, really important that for kids as a re at a relatively young age to start building that understanding between the natural world of resources and indeed what the, um, what the industry is all about and, and what it provides for um, the globe in terms of, you know, again, going back to the mobile phone, without, without the resources industry, we wouldn't have mobile phones. So we're, um, there's uh, an education piece for um, students as early as primary school um, around that natural resources space. Um, and to do this, we actually do have the technology available to um, provide a, an interactive experience that can be aligned with the school curriculum. So the, the very exciting project is um, a piece of work that I've been doing collaboratively with Susie Urbaniak from the Core Learning Foundation, as well as an IT expert and a game developer um, to design interactive curriculum embedded and accessible games. We're just starting with a focus on year six and year eight students at this stage. And the Australian curriculum themes, um, and this is really important that these games are embedded within the curriculum. They're not a bolt on, they actually will be part of the, the, the learning curriculum. So um, the, uh, the themes though in uh, year six are, is around natural disasters. And then for year eight, the curriculum um, talks about um, the earth sciences space. Um, so for the year six students, um, we've got a project that is, be, that is proposed using the Minecraft Education Edition. And in that project, the students will apply their scientific knowledge to collaboratively mitigate the impacts of geoscientific natural disasters such as volcanoes, earthquakes and tsunamis. The premise of the game is actually around um, the students' um, competing a series of challenges to, to become part of a mine emergency response team. Because I think it is important that the students actually correlate um, the, the good that resources companies do for the community. Um, and the emergency response teams, they've been working um, tirelessly for decades, but there often is not that, um, that connection made between what the resources companies do. Um, and, uh, and so this will actually help to tease that out. The year eight 
um, game is, is really exciting. It's, um, it's actually using a party games uh, concept, which I had not previously heard of. Um, and that's, um, that's actually taking um, a scenario of a train laden with iron ore that's passing through the Pilbara from mine to port. And it actually teases out a connection as to um, various aspects of the train's load, the train itself, or the rail network in terms of how they came to be um, from the formation of oxygen, where students actually get to be a stromatolite and compete against each other to create oxygen, um, to the student being able to virtually descend into a primordial sea in a capsule to in search of black smokers that actually then when you add the oxygen, you start to, to form banded iron formations. So they're actually, they can get amongst the formation of, um, of what is you know, a very, very important um, export product for Australia. Um, and uh, they, they learn about the combustion uh, reaction fueling the train's engine. And then very importantly, they actually learn about the, the ancient indigenous songline routes. Um, and those routes are, are along um, where the, the modern train line either goes or indeed deviates depending upon the, the um, discussions that the students have virtually with Indigenous landowners about, um, about the, the history of the country and, um, and then how we best manage that moving forward. Um, these games will also be downloadable onto portable devices, which will be important for students to be able to take those home to parents and show them what they've been doing and just start that positive discussion about, um, about careers in the resources industry and a really understanding using using science and, and maths and engineering about the, um, the, the, re the interrelationship between the, uh, the natural resources and what actually happens in the world. So I think it's an area that, um, that we, we really haven't focused on very much. And if we start building that relationship at a very young age, then I think kids will, it will be something that actually does come into the mind of a student when they're starting to think about what subjects to choose as they get to the later um, end of high school and indeed what career might they, um, might they be able to take on. So we're, we're about to, um, to go out to tender for um, game developers to create the games. Um, but yeah, it is, it is actually a very exciting um, piece of work that we're doing. Fantastic, Bill. Uh, makes me uh, want to go back to year six uh, so that I could participate. Um, but um, you're right, you know, there, it takes generations, you know, to, to affect positive change. And what we do want to see is, you know, families getting involved in uh, conversations about uh, the importance of the resources sector and, and how it's actually mm. Uh, driving uh, so much of the um, technological advancements and reduction in carbon and all the rest of it. So um, sounds great. So any uh, further comments uh, from you, uh, Darren? We're down to the last few minutes. Yeah, for sure. Look, I think that that's really good. I mean, it, it really takes me back to, uh, you know, a big issue that we were having back in 2018 um, that it was, um, I guess, well discussed at the time, but there was a youth insight survey that went out to high school age students that asked them if they knew anything about mining careers in the mining industry. And 60% of them came back and said they knew nothing at all about mining. Uh, so look, anything that we can do to, you know, educate people, to let people know about, you know, mining as a fundamental thing, as careers in mining, as the positives of mining, I think the industry really got a you know a kick in the bum back in in those times and needed to move along and um you know initiatives like what jill's talking about like the core learning foundation uh like the focus on mining camps uh the things that um that are some great initiatives by the industry uh are helping do that and i think that you know anything in that space is going to be great and i mean talking about some of the focus on mining camps we uh curtain um, along with, with industry is organising one for January next year that's aimed at year 10 to 12 female students um, to go, you know, go up to Kalgoorlie, visit some mining operations and, and see how they go. Um, we sent that out to a few contacts recently and for, uh, I think the numbers were, there was about 30 available spots on there. They had 200 applications to try and get on the mining camp. So, um, look, it's a great start. We're not there yet, but... 
um, look, anything is going to help. So I think it's fantastic. Absolutely. Um, no, it's great to see uh, things like that happening. And, uh, you know, the fact that the response was so overwhelming is is wonderful. And um, mm. uh, I know in that survey too, there was a, a really big difference between um, pe kids in the city and kids in rural or mining areas in terms of their, their knowledge of what goes on in the industry. So um, we are now out of time. So I would like to thank both of you uh, for uh, your wonderful insights. It's been a great discussion and we could probably go on uh, all day. So um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, who has joined us online. Uh, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.